Hi, and welcome along to the All Guns Blazing podcast with my man DT in the building. How you doing? Sorry, you caught me. I'm eating. Eating? <laughs> what are you doing, man? I'm eating. Hey, listen, I'm having lunch. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Lunch. Listen, one of the bonuses of working from home is that the fridge is right next to me. <laughs> this is a podcast, man. Be professional. I am being professional. I just didn't expect you to introduce me so quickly. God hell, man. Come in on. And, and, and by the way, what, what's happened to the red beard? I knew you bottled this thing, you know. That's you why it should have been to shave it off, like that guy originally said. It was there for a few days, and then I just had to get rid of it because it was horrendous. I looked it, like I looked like something out of Braveheart. It troops was, again. Uh, Another troops. The oh, same. Shut up, man. Don't it is. Don't I remember at the time, anymore. you were ah. saying, I'm not going to be like troops, I'll do it for real this time, blah, blah. And look, hmm. you've done exactly what he did. No. Washed it out and done something. No, no. Actually, I re-dyed it. Sorry. Still the same. Mm. Look, at the end of the day, right, it's difficult getting the proper products given the current situation. So when things do go back to normal, I will actually do it properly and I'll have it dyed in a proper way so it's bright red. I'll even go to a game at the Emirates with it. I don't care. Don't try cut to it off. Shut Shave up. it off. I'll cut you off if you carry on. <laughs> Shave it off. You've got enough time to grow it back. Nah, mate. This took me over a year. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not one of these uh... fortunate that can grow a beard in like a couple of weeks. This took me time to grow this. Nah, mate. Nah, man. Oh, this guy, man. This guy, I'm telling you, man. Boy, a bottle job. Another one. Mm -hmm. Another one and bottle job, the forfeit. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Quick to yeah. make other people do forfeits, but bottle it. Listen but anyway, <laughs> don't say nothing, mate. you got nothing to say. Right? I've got of, but I've got a mouthful because I'm eating and drinking. <laughs> Let's get into the football. Um, first yeah. of all, we're going to start off the French league. I don't mm -hmm. know what you thought of this. I, I was a bit shocked. I mean, we heard the other day about the Dutch league. Mm -hmm. but the French league's kind of on another level, isn't it? It's a bigger league. You've got big teams in there like PSG, Lyon, mm -hmm. Marseille. For that to go, that's significant. Could yep. that mean that the Premier League doesn't get played out? Because mm. we all know there's a will over here to get it done. Mm. That's a, you know, and and it and there it's a government decision, just like it happened in 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 Dutch football, where the government basically said, no, "Listen, no big sporting events until September." Yeah, that's another country now that's done it. If if they were to say that over here, that's it. The season's done. Mm. Yeah, do you know what the thing is? Is it, it's governments that care more about their people um, than profit, because that's what the French government and the Dutch government have done. They basically turned around and said, look, it's too much of a risk. We all love football. We all love sport. We all want it back. We all want to be able to go to stadiums and, you know, grab random people and celebrate goals and do all those wonderful things that felt like so long ago. But their people are what's important. They've lost lives, you know, of their countrymen in, and not even to the magnitude of what we have in the UK. But yet they've looked at it and said, no, putting a stop to this right now. Yeah, it's going to be hard. This is, you know, the first steps, but we're going to make those steps right. Because what we don't want to do is to try and go down that route of behind closed doors or integrating people back slowly but surely. And then we have a second wave. And then we're all the way back to square one. What happens if you start the league and one player or an official to, at a club catches coronavirus and ends up in intensive care? then what are you going to do? How will that be on your conscience as an organisation that a player, member of staff, manager, whoever it may be, might end up dying from it? That's the harsh reality. There's, you know, the, the bottom end, the, the top end of the scale, sorry, which is death. And then the bottom end of the scale is probably like a Jens Lehmann, for example, where we heard about him catching coronavirus. He was over it within a couple of days felt like he'd experienced worse flu. But everyone's different. So what, what happens then, Robbie? 
You know, you're back yeah. to square one. And, and their governments have turned around and said, look, no, we're not going to risk that. We're not going to risk our people. No, no sport, no events, nothing done. September. It sounds like, it sounds like you're a great, you, you'd like that over here then. Well, no, do you, do you know what it is, right? I don't actually care, right? Let's take the banter out of this now, yeah? I actually don't care about Liverpool winning the title. I've said all along, right? Take banter aside. I've said from the very beginning, Liverpool deserve to win the title. I just don't feel that you can give them a title when you've not mathematically won it. Despite how great their season's been, despite how great, you know, and, and far ahead they are, they've not mathematically won it. And that don't sit right with me. But... If for the greater good and to protect, you know, the people in this country and to protect the players and the management and staff and stuff means giving Liverpool the title, give them it. Just give them the title. Let them have it. Just, I don't care. I care more about, you know, the people. Over 21,000 people have died in the UK alone. You know, this is a serious, serious situation here, Robbie. And don't, I've said this, we love football. I would love nothing more than to see your ugly face right next to me. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's the old saying it. Listen, we come from an old generation. It says Brad Pitt. Yeah, listen. We come, we come from an older generation where that's a, a term of like endearment, if anything. Do you know what I mean? But I would love to see you again just to, I mean, just have an argument with you face to face about something and just talk football and Go to a game and, you know, I want to see the, you know, the the drive to the game when you do like your video. We're going to do this. And I want to do a match day vlog and just experience it. And I just want to come out of the stadium and have that feeling. But right now there's more important things, Robbie. There's more important things, man. Do you know what I mean? And does the English FA um, want to have the, that kind of weight on their conscience that something would happen? to somebody, you know, within the game, you know, and we all know the main objective behind this is money. Let's be real about it, Robbie. Yeah. It's not, you know, the FA and the Premier League are not sitting there and going, we need to get football back again because we miss it so much. We want to give the people a little something. Yeah. We really, really, really miss that so much. The be and end always, they miss it because of the money. But then, it, it, but then you, you can also, yeah, but it's survival as well. Survival, not just of uh, the Premier League and the FA, survival of a lot of football clubs around around the country. You know what I mean? Well, this, could put them out, this could put them out of business. Robbie, Robbie, the lower league football has already been cancelled. Lower league football yeah. stuff. And they're complaining about it. And they're complaining. A lot of those clubs are complaining about it because they're saying it could put them out of business. We, we also have to kind of... Um, level things up and say, right, when do we start getting back to normal? When do we start? Because, you know, a lot of football clubs, as I said, could go out of business. That's could, It could be over for them. If yeah. we don't, we, we've got to be looking at some sort of plan to get back. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hear what you're saying, but, you know, it, it's on both, and it's not, obviously, it's not just a football thing. Even, just in general, people going back to work. Yeah. You I'm know, starting so... to see that already, though. I'm starting to see that already. Everything just seems a lot busier in the world. Like, people are starting to go back. I've noticed they've opened KFC and things like that now, and they're having a drive through and stuff. So it's like people are slowly starting to integrate themselves, you know? But mm. this situation, Robbie, man, it's like... Playing the Premier League in June is not going to help teams in non-league. It's not going to help them survive. Their seasons are over. Mm. What, what, what good is the Premier League playing going to help them? The only way you're going to help them is if you let them have their seasons back. And they can... But no, then they can't all right. but what about league? What about the championship? League one, league two. You, there's teams there that could go yeah, bust. Yeah, you've heard, yeah. you've, you've seen a lot of them come on radio and TV. A lot of the owners of these clubs, mm -hmm. and they're like, you know what, we could be out of business. Yes, I know that, Robbie. But what I'm saying is, is that they only really care about the Premier League. That's what they want to complete, the Premier League. 
because that's where you have so much more. You've got your way for knocking on the door, saying you've got to do this, and the teams in the cha- in the Premiership are the ones that are in the European competitions. So there's that knock-on effect. But with France, they've turned around and said, don't care. PSG are already in the quarterfinals of the Champions League. But yeah, yeah. they've said season done. So what happens if UEFA go, well, you know what? We're going to play football again in July. We're going to play the Champions League games, let's say for argument's sake. What happens then? A PSG expected to play a quarterfinal in the Champions League when they've got no football at all going on? You can't expect yeah. them to just, you know, let, let, yeah, they might be able to train for a couple of weeks and get a bit of sharpness, but would they be able to go into a competitive game? You know, let's say the quarterfinals, they draw an English side and the English league's back playing or a German side and the German league's back playing. PSG are not playing and they've got to go against the team that are 100% and they're 50%. So are they, you know, have they disqualified themselves mm. from the Champions League now? Or do they yeah, have <laughs> There's all kind of conundrums that's, um, propping up now because of this whole thing. And I mean, another one of those conundrums is um, what happens to some of these players? Saliba. He comes back to play for us this season. If the league starts in June, he's an Arsenal player. And I went into this yesterday, Robbie, right? I had a look. I had a real, real look into this situation. Arsenal registered him for this season. Now, yeah, they registered him, registered. Now, yeah, they registered him at the start of the season. And then in January you then have to make a new registration for the remainder of the season. Arsenal registered him in that again. Now, he's not in the original 25 squad. He's in the under-21 squad. Now, for mm-hmm. anyone that says they're completely different, well, no, they're not. Martinelli is registered as a player in the under-21 squad. Um, so he is eligible to play. There's no you know, contracts or all this kind of stuff. He's an Arsenal player. He's simply on loan. Right, the contract of that loan ends on June the 30th. So yeah. with the league in France being when it you know September or wherever it may be, it's done. So he yeah, now he's, comes he's, he's he's finished that yeah, his contract's yeah. done uh, um sent, uh, sent, well it will be finished on the 30th of June. Yeah, but then technically Arsenal can go to Saint Etienne and say, Well, he's never gonna play for you again, so you might as well just terminate the, the loan deal. It's not worth hanging it out till June the 30th because he's not going to play for you. So terminate it mm. and we get our player back. This is it, not... Yeah. In you know theory, I mean? he could. I, I could see a lot of complaints coming in about it. Oh, but massive. In theory, in theory, you're right. He can. Uh, when I looked into it as well, he's the same thing as it would either be he's available after June the 30th or if they, like you said, if they terminated it, he'd be available right now. Um yeah. It's like Emil Smith Rowe. We sent him on loan to Huddersfield, but he's a registered player. He can come back and take a part. Why not? It's not like someone tried comparing it to me yesterday and saying Zayac when Chelsea have signed him. I say it's completely different. He's not a Chelsea player. They've Mm. signed him for next season. He's not registered for this season, and you cannot register a player mid season. Saliba is definitely registered. He's an Arsenal player. And go and have a look. He's registered in the squad. I don't know why they do it, you know, but he's a registered player. He's eligible to play. Mm. Well, he's a registered player because he's an Arsenal player on loan. So basically they registered him in the 49-man squad. He's registered. Mm -hmm. And then they've sent him back on loan because they bought him. So they bought him. They've registered him as their player. And then they've sent him back on loan to St. Etienne. And now, like you said, the season's finished. That registration finishes on the 30th of June. After the 30th of June, he's eligible to play. The season, we're being told, if it does start, won't be before June. So he could possibly play a part. It would be really interesting to see if he... if he, I mean, why not use him? Why not I use know. him if he's available? This is the thing. I turned around and said, right, how many other clubs are in this situation? I don't actually know. So maybe someone could let us know mm. in the comment section if they know of another player in this kind of situation within the Premier League. But what would be interesting, say we get the season up and running, we get to the final game of the season, right? Hypothetically speaking, we're in a battle for the Champions League place with Manchester United. Final game of the season, Manchester United have won their game. We need to win 
to take that fourth spot. It's currently 1-1, 90th minute, corner, whipped in, Saliba scores. A player that shouldn't have any part of this season has just scored to take us into the Champions League next season. <laughs> And you're telling me Manchester United are not going to be going absolutely bonkers about it. Of course they would. <laughs> what are we actually doing wrong? It's, we're not doing anything wrong. We're just, yeah. The, 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 fans. the other thing is as well, I mean, so many things have been propping up this week is that this whole, we're starting to see now that how Brexit might have an effect on football because oh, um, there was oh. a, there was talk. There was talk yesterday about um, Brexit that um, players from the European Union will have to go through a points-based system under new plans that they're looking to draw up um, for the Premier League. So um, it will be a points-based system designed to enable the best talents to play in England, but put put restrictions in place so as not as not to disadvantage young homegrown players. So mm. that's a thing that they're looking to bring in because of Brexit is the Premier League. The FA, everybody's looking at it with the government. Mm. This could have a major effect because if you look at it, um, how they operate that system at the moment is kind of like you have to have played at an international level. You've had to yeah. hit certain hit certain criteria to be able to come to the Premier League if you're from any country outside the European Union. So yeah. if you're Brazilian or you're African player, we had that guy, N. McCarley. Mm. He didn't play a single game for Arsenal because he couldn't get a work permit. Wasn't that the same with Yaya Torre as well? Yaya Torre. Originally, yeah, when we were, originally when we were interested in signing him. Yeah, and he played, um, he played friendly against Barnett, didn't he? But we couldn't get a work permit sorted out for yeah. it. Yeah, so that's right. Yeah. There's, so it will have a. It is, I mean, if you look at it like somebody like Gwen Doozy is what I was thinking about yesterday, who mm -hmm. came from the French second division. We wouldn't be able to sign a guy like that, would we? Because he no. would be, he he, you know, he wouldn't have played for France yet. He wouldn't. Have, so a lot of those sort of um, prospects. Mm -hmm. And players that are sort of under the radar that you can pick up from European football that, you know, has usually been able to come in and play, won't be able to play. That's going to be one wow. of the consequences of Brexit. Now, you can argue it both ways. You can say that it's it's going to be a good thing for young English talent. Mm -hmm. Because um, if you're Joe Willock now or, you know, Sackers and guys like that, you're thinking, well, actually, the pathway to getting into the first team opens up better for me because they're now going to have to go with more English talent. They're not just mm -hmm. going to be able to go and scour Europe and get all the best. But then it could also put us at a disadvantage to all the other teams in Europe because they're going to be able to pick up some of these real top talents, um, get them really cheap, and then when they do become international players and top players, sell them to England for mega money. So... Yeah. Look, at the end of the day, it could work both ways. Like you're saying, you know, we could produce top talent and they could get sent out, you know, abroad somewhere. But um, I think it's beneficial to some of the young English talent. I really do. And, you know, you look at, you look at some of the youngsters, for example, at Chelsea. Mm. I, I don't see half of, the, half of the point of playing for the Chelsea youth system because... Until they got banned, they never used it. They never cared about it. You know, they, they won everything at youth level. They had an unbelievable side. And the only reason why so many have broke through right now is because they were on a transfer ban and they had no choice but to use them. So maybe things like this will actually yeah. help. You, you, you might miss out now on seeing some of those real exciting players that have come mm -hmm. without big reputations and names. So... You think of it, Vieira, he wasn't playing for the French national team when we bought him. He was right under the radar. Yeah. You know, you wouldn't have seen a Vieira. You might not have seen a Robert Perez. Those guys made their name at Arsenal. Yeah. You know, of and, you know even if you look yeah. around the leagues now, yeah. I mean, yeah. somebody yeah. like yeah. Kante. Kante wasn't playing for France, was he? You know what I mean? He's come to Leicester, made his name at Leicester, and made now at Chelsea. You know what I mean, so you're not going to see these sort of players, those players will go to European teams. And then if we do want to buy them, they're going to be mega money. So 
These yeah. are some of the consequences of this. I told you not to vote Brexit, didn't I? Oh, shut up, man. Look, I, vote. <laughs> I don't even try it. I'm trying to do with coronavirus. I don't need <laughs> as well, you absolute mug. Um, but no, you know, but going back to that as well, Robert Pires. Robert Pires was more of a, a household name when we actually signed him. He was. Um, he was he won in the French. He won in the French team, though, was he? I don't uh, think he was in the French team yet. What year did we sign him? Um, we signed Henri in '99. They won the World Cup in '98. Was he a part of the World Cup squad? I can't even remember. I don't think so. I don't think he was a free. He wasn't a French international. He came. He's from Arsenal. He made his name really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but I mean, he was. He was not. Emerging talent. Unknown. Yeah, he was not a complete unknown like a Patrick Vieira yeah. or a Nicolas Anelka. Um, Put it this way, if, he's, if, if they do it strict like how they do when his country's outside of the European Union at the moment, yeah, it would stop a lot of... Because you see a lot of um, talented Brazilian players and talented Argentinian players and that. They go straight to... You know, you see them going to Barcelona and Real Madrid and all these various teams around Europe, Porto... All, because we can't buy them. We can't buy them because they don't hit the criteria to be able to come into this country. Then when they do go to those clubs now, do really, really well, break into their national team, by the time we want to buy them now, we're paying like five, six, seven times the amount of what they were originally bought for, where we could have originally gone and maybe got one of those talents from those countries and bought them straight in. So it will have a big effect Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know what? I think this is something that they've wanted to do all along anyway, because we've always had this, well, not us, but I mean, there's always been this argument over um, too many foreigners in the Premier League. Um, yeah. do, you remember the, do you remember the uproar when Arsene Wenger was the first manager to field a team full of... Yeah. And do you remember the uproar? It, it's just, yeah. there's so many um, people... There's that pros have, and cons, like you said, isn't there? Because... The thing is about it as well, one of the reasons why the Premier League is such a strong worldwide brand is because there are players mm. playing from all over the world in the Premier League. Yeah. And so that's one, one of the reasons thing. why people love it all around the world. Yeah. But what's the one thing and the one reason why they want to do this? Because of the national team. Because mm. they feel that the national team is not benefiting because there's not enough good players coming through because we're using all the, the foreign mm. ones and that. I, I think that's an absolute load of crap, to be quite honest with you. Because since 1966, England have been crap. All right? And it's got nothing to do with foreign players. You know, what well, happened in the World you Cup? Could, was, you, could make an argument, you, could, you could make an argument for it, DT, because look at somebody like that Phil Foden who's at City. Mm -hmm. The guy can't get a game. And everybody knows how talented he is. He's an excellent player. And he can't get a game, right? And then you look at somebody like Jaden Sancho, who's who was also at Man City, had to leave Manchester City so that he could get first-team football because there's so many, you know, they'll go out and buy Amares and something like that. And then the guy's gone to um, Borussia Dortmund, and he's one of the best players in German football. He's one of the best young players in the whole of Europe. But if he'd have stayed at City... He'd probably be still be playing in their reserves. Mm. So you can argue that, you know, yeah, it, it, a lot of players do stand in the way of these young players. You know, we it, we as fans do it. We are immediately looking for that big name from abroad to bring in, aren't we? You know, uh, Joe, yeah, Willett, Joe Willett doesn't sound like a fashionable name, but if it had been, if we would have bought him from, I don't know, Spanish football and it was Joe Willico or something like that, Jose <laughs> Jose Walico, right? Um, I mean, yeah. like, oh, who is this kid? Yeah, I've seen his stats. Whoa, he looks brilliant. Whoa. But because maybe, he's not um, maybe that's the reason why, like, Sancho is okay because his surname Sancho. It sounds. Like <laughs> it's not English sounding, is it? It's like Sancho. That's kind of like a Brazilian <laughs> type feel to it. But it's yeah. I don't know, man. It's just listen. As far as I'm concerned, the England team's been crap anyway, apart from. Euro 96. Euro, Euro 96. Um, oh, hold on. They did the last World Cup they got to the semi final, remember? Oh, mate, don't even take that as being anything. Listen. Listen, England had an absolute gimme all the way to the semi final. Oh, the moment they played one decent team, 
They got slapped and they bottled it. And Harry Kane only had to pass the ball to Raheem Sterling. Fool. <laughs> All he had to do, 2 0, game over. Pass the ball. Pass the ball. England no. have got a good team now. They've got a good team. You know what I mean? They've got a good they've got a good team. I'm not saying it's good enough to win the World Cup or Euros, but they now have a good team. But you, imagine... You say that, sorry, but, but you say that, but do you not think that a lot of these English players are learning from the foreign players as well? Yeah, they've, they've learned from foreign players, but also I think that the English clubs now have got excellent academies. Mm. And so, you know what I mean? They're, they're, they're developing very well, um, you know. But they've got to be able to get a chance. I mean, there's pros and cons to this, uh, and we're going to have to keep a close eye on it and mm -hmm. see how the you know how the point system is going to be. But certainly, if it's as strict as they use it for players coming from Africa and South America, and that it's yeah, it's going to make it very difficult for some of the signings that we see. Especially, you know, I mean, teams are going to have to use a lot of their young players, but that, that could be a good mm -hmm. thing. But it'd be yeah. interesting to see what people in the comments are thinking about that. Talking mm -hmm. about, um, you, you touched on Chelsea there. The the big rumour this week has all been about Willian. Now, Willian, um, we, last week we were talking about the possibility of Aubameyang going to Chelsea. But the Willian, um, would you have Willian? Said it said to want about 120 grand a week as well. So he wouldn't well, be, no. be on a free, but look, first and foremost, don't ever mock pictures of a Bamiang in a Chelsea shirt again. Just don't do it. It don't look right. It's disgusting. Just stop doing it. All right. <laughs> not joining Chelsea. It's not happening. He's not going to Chelsea. It's not going to How Chelsea. How do you know? Listen, this, I'm saying nothing. How do you know? Listen, listen. How do you Oba, know? Oba is going to sign the thing. Man's going to sign that thing. I'm telling you, I'm confident that he will sign it. Don't let me down, Oba. Don't make me be a meme. <laughs> Don't make me be a meme, please, man. But it's just, Say it again. Look. Say it again. Huh? No. Say it again. Hold on. One minute. I'm not, I'm one, minute. one minute. One minute. Say it again. <laughs> Go away, Robbie. Put yourself back in, man. Get lost. I know what you're trying to do. <laughs> I'm setting the meme up, man. I've got enough memes of me. I've got to get you. We're going to get one of you. Bro, you got caught again the other day. <laughs> you got caught again the other day. And you're lucky I haven't even dropped it yet. <laughs> but on one of your live streams, you someone put the name Peter File. Yeah, but that, no, but yeah, I saw that one. But that guy, the way I said it, I didn't get caught. And that guy was an idiot. Because if he's labelling himself that, I feel sorry for him. If he's calling himself Peter File. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I saw that. I didn't get caught. I saw that one. So if you oh. notice, I said it with a gap. Oh, you are so innocent. Bro. That's the thing. You're so innocent. Um, look, the Willian. Um, how old is he? 31. Ah, see, this is the thing. It's a lot of Chelsea fans don't like him at all. Would he benefit? Huh? A lot of them rate him. Huh? Rate him. Yeah, there's a lot that don't rate him. A lot of them went mad when he got Eden Hazard's number 10. You know, but... Would you have him? Maybe for the experience. Could be someone that's useful, but... I think given that kind of wage, given that kind of wage, that'd be a waste of a wage. That'd be Don't a waste. I, I'd rather we use some of that money to give a Bamiang a new contract. Yeah, exactly, to... exactly. You know, what I mean, he's younger. <laughs> you know, sort a sort of Bamiang's to, to, to me another one of Chelsea's used up players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Gallas, Willian, come on, man. How many more of these? No, we don't want him. David Luiz. Huh? <laughs> David Luiz. <laughs> David Luiz, that's another one. I mean, how many more? <laughs> they must be laughing their heads off over there in West London, man. I know. I know. We, give, nah, we give them Ashley Cole and they give us William Gallas. You know we, I mean? even, even when we give him Giroud, he still come back and score the goal that won them the final of the Europa League. Listen. We do not need 
Willian. We've got Saka there. We've got Martinelli can play on the left. You've got Aubameyang who can play on the left. We do not need Willian. He doesn't reach Nelson. Reese Nelson can play wide. Why do we need Aubameyang for? I'm sorry. About what? Sorry, why do, <laughs> why do we need Willian? Say that again, <laughs> you. Say that again. <laughs> I want to use that bit. We both certainly, we both certainly need Aubameyang. Why do we need Willian? We don't need Willian, man. And we're reading to, you know, this week as well that, you know, Arteta is going to have to get very creative in the transfer market because the money ain't going to be there. Also losing loads and loads of money. And we're probably looking on, you know, I know everyone's talking about Partey and this player and that player and Aurier, and, but it's probably going to be loan deals, mm. swap deals, isn't it? Mm. So what, um, what happened to this big injection of money from Stan Kroenke that we were told about? You know, that's why the players are taking the wage cut. They have to ask Lee Gunner. Hold on. Oh, no, 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 no. You're not getting away with this one. Hold on a minute. We were told, weren't we, in that debate that, um, you know, that's why the players are taking the wage cut. Stan's going to back his talk and put the money in the club and everything. But now, apparently, Mikel Arteta has to get all these, you know, little bits and pieces out and try and create an art attack. It's like, yeah, let's just create something out of nothing. Sorry, well, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute, Robbie. Well, sorry. What was it that was reported only a couple of days ago about the, um, by Ornestine and that, that um, the players that were objecting to the wage cut, their reasoning for it. What was their reasoning for it? That they wanted to, to see where the money was going etc. And the final piece, which was such a nice bit that I saw, which was they wanted to know that the owner would be investing in the team. What's wrong with what they did and wanting to know? So, OK, we'll take a wage cut. Cool. But are you going to go and invest in this team? Are you going to make us competitive? Because if you're not, you ain't getting shit. You're not having none of my money. Especially when you try driving me out the door anyway. Stuff you. You're not having nothing. Ursula again. Is, I'm keeping it. Get over it. You should so, work for you, You're going to work for Ozil now, aren't you? Hey, listen, man. I'm his, like... <laughs> his advisor. <laughs> look, at the end of the day, we look, we, 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 look, we already know, yeah, that the whole of football, there's not going to be ridiculous amounts of money flying around. Even Newcastle. You know, they're going to spend probably the most because they've got the most money, but then they have to work within restrictions because of financial fair play and whatnot. But the majority of the Premier League are going to work within restrictions. They're going to have to because, you know, let's look at Liverpool, for example. Liverpool tried furloughing their staff. They can't then turn around and go and splash 60, 70 million pound on a player, can they? Yeah, and, and, and it's going to be the same for us. And that's what I'm saying. It's going to be lots of loan deals and swap deals. Mm. Yeah, so, we do you know. I, I do think that the Thomas Party rumours are, are are true. I also believe as well that... No, 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 because Robbie, listen... True that no, they're interested in him, but I can't no, say no, 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 no. Listen, listen. The, the thing is with um, Atletico Madrid is that the news that came out last week where UEFA have said, if your season's avoided... You go with your um, what was what was the term they called it in terms of the final placings for the season? Um, oh, you know what I'm on about. How mm, the league yeah. will be decided, right? Yeah. Well, that means that Atletico are out of European football altogether because they're miles away in in the Liga. They're in a brand new stadium. They've got huge. Well, they've been there a few years, right? Yeah, yeah, but yeah. they're still paying it off. Mm. Right, we know all about how difficult it is. They got huge debts, you know, and they're open to selling their players because they need yeah. the money. No, listen, they're open to selling their players, but are we Arsenal? Have we got forty million pounds or thirty-five million? I mean, the release clause is uh, reportedly forty-three million pounds. Yeah, right. Even if it's thirty-five million, where are we going to get that money from? We're we're going to be in just as bad a position. As Atletico, we've got no European football. We've had no Champions League for the past three years. 
but Robbie, the one the one thing I will say is that Arsenal are very good at structuring packages. We always seem to do it. Structuring and packages. Look, look at the, the wage. You know, I was I was going. No, 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 no. I'm not on about that. I'm on about the structure of payments in terms of a player's. Um, All right, so like that, like the Pepe deal, for instance. Yeah, like a Pepe deal where you split it over the course of five years, around twenty odd million per season or whatever it was. Um, and and do you know what? A lot of the deals in football now are actually done like that. A lot of people look at the headline and go, "Oh, look, this player cost eighty five million pound. Ah, uh, where did they get eighty five million pound from?" It doesn't work like that. There's, I, I can't actually remember the last time a club actually stumped up that kind of money up front. But Arsenal. I just think we're in big trouble as well. And that's why they're talking about these loan deals and swapping. And you look at the, you know, I was going through, wait, look at also some of their wages, yeah? I'm going to run you through, I'm going to run you through some of the wages. I was looking at it earlier. Right? Is this before or after the wage cuts? Before, before the wage cuts. Okay. Mesut, Mesut Ozil, 350 grand a week, as we all know. Abamyang, 200 grand a week, looking for a new deal, but, Deserves it, you know what I mean? Because he, he gets, you know. Um, Lacazette's 180 grand a week. Pepe, 140. David Luiz, 125 grand a week. Kalasinac, 100 grand a week. Hector Bellerin, 110,000 a week. Leno, 100,000. Xhaka, 100,000. Socrates, 92,000. Mustafi, 90,000. Torreira, 75,000, um, and then you start to run through some of the lesser players. Um, and then you've even got guys like, um, remember, Mikatarian, which, all right, we're paying half half of his wages, but he also is on nearly £180,000 a week. Mohamed El Neni on, sorry, on uh, £55,000 a week. It's a lot of wage, a lot of very high earn. And I mean, some of those players there, Socrates, Mustafi, these are not top line players that are on very, very high wages, aren't they? Yeah, well, you we know, know it. Abby we've Louise, got... 120 grand a week, we've got 100. Mate, we've got players on Champions League money. It's like, you know, it's, what's the old saying about, um, hmm. you know, um, like, 110,000 a week. Yeah, it's like Sorry. saying you've got champagne lifestyle. But lemonade money. Yeah. A and, lot and of very average players, really, or, or of being average. Even somebody like Hector, that he's on 110 grand a week. That's a lot. That's way more than most teams are paying for better players. So yeah. you can see the problems that Arsenal have. Like you said, there's a Champions League wages that these players are on. Yeah. And they need to get a lot of those players off the wage bill. Yeah, they don't do. need to come off of that wage bill before they can progress. Yeah, massively. The, the the one thing I will say about Abamyang is that I think that what's actually helped us in the current is the current situation, um, because a lot of clubs know that with Abamyang on two hundred grand a week, they have to match minimum match that total mm. and then go above. Um, the Chelsea that, could do that though. That's the one club that could do it. Well, this is the thing. Given the current situation, I don't think it's as clear cut as that because, you know, maybe if he was a free transfer, it might be a bit easier to free up a wage when you're not paying a, um, you know, a, a fee. But given the fact that he's still got a year left on his contract means that someone would have to still stump up 30 odd million yeah. pounds and then go and get over 200 grand. And I think Aubameyang might well be looking at that and saying, I'm 31. I'm not really going to get a better deal than what I'm being offered at the moment, well, given the situation. I've been saying that all along, and I've been saying that, you know, look at the clubs, you know, there's not a lot of options for him. No. Right? There's not a lot of options for him, you know what I mean? So, but as a, a the, yeah, and also on that, when you look at some of these players, if you are uh, Socrates, mm -hmm. 92,000 pounds a week, why would you want to leave? If you're Mustafi yeah. on 90 grand a week, especially now, who's going to pay that? Yeah. Who's going to pay Xhaka £100,000 a week? Mm. You know? Who's going to pay Kalasinac £100,000 a week? Who's going to pay Hector Bellerin £110,000? David Luiz £125,000? You know, who's going to pay them these money? They're not going to get that anywhere, are they? 
No, only right, Arsenal. So, so they, you, they'd have to be stupid to leave right now. Mm. And that's the problem that Arsenal have until a lot of these players' contracts run out, which some of them are, you know, I think uh, Socrates is out, he's out of contract next season. I think Mustafi's uh, out of contract next season. Ozil, uh, there'll be... Huh? Sorry? Uh, yeah, I'm saying Ozil. Ozil. I mean, and Ozil. There'll be a huge amount of money coming off the wage bill, won't there? Yeah. That's why I don't understand with the Abamian thing. You've got a guy of real top quality. Swallow that for one season, the fact that you still might have to. But at the end of next season, there's going to be a lot of money freed up wages-wise. Yeah. And if Arsenal are smart with it and go and get emerging talents and get, you know, get the wage bill can come right down because they've been paying ridiculous mm -hmm. amounts of money. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Because the, the Aubameyang situation, for example, if, say, we decide, you know what, we're going to keep you for the final year and you can go for free, um, I think we would have got our money's worth out of him anyway. Let's mm. be real about it. The, we've already got our money's worth. Um, yeah. But what I look at would be that if he was to go at the end of next season, 200 grand off the wage bill, Meza Ozil, 350, there's over half a million already. David Luiz, I think, contract ends. So there's David Luiz. Yeah, so you'd say there's another 200 grand with those two alone. Um, Mustafi, I think, is close to his contract ending. Yeah, as well. His ends, his ends, Mustafi's uh, one ends. Yeah, so we've got what's that about seven, seven to eight hundred grand a week in wages? Yeah, nearly a million pound a week in wages, <laughs> nearly yep. a million pound. And then you'll be able to use that money. And that, because a lot of people don't, I, I keep trying to explain this to some people, but people don't seem to grasp that transfers are more than just a fee. People see a fee and go, oh, he's only 40 million pounds. Go and buy him. Go and buy him. It's about everything else. You know, yeah. the structure. The, and, you um, know, and, you know, especially when you get players. Players that come on free transfers can demand high wages, like Kolasinac. You know, he's a free transfer, yeah. but he's getting over a hundred thousand pounds a week. Yeah, and then they got signing on fees as well. Hmm. I think about, and then the club has to buy image rights. The club has to do all the stuff with their endorsements now because these all have to be included in contracts and you know certain stipulations and whatnot and cans and can do can't do and. Yeah, there's so much more that goes into it. But getting rid of those players where they're literally coming off the wage bill, there's no, you know, we know that we've got to swallow our pride over a lot of deals that were done wrong. We know that. We're not going to go and get our money back on Mesut Ozil. We're not going to get our money back on, you know, a Mustafi and players like that. We're not going to. These are all part of the old regime that messed everything up. You know, and I, I said uh, I'd done an interview with you after we played Manchester City away. And it was um, the one where Lacazette scored in. We lost 3-1 and he'd scored between, uh, I can't remember what keeper there then, but it scored for his legs. And I turned around and said that we're about five or six years, a good five or six years behind being where we need to be because it's going to take a huge rebuilding process and to get out the old to bring in the new. There's going to be a lot of bumps along the way. And it's just how we ride those bumps, you know. And Unai uh -huh. was the poor guy the first time round. And I don't think that he helped himself. A lot of his decisions didn't help himself. And I think he alienated too many people within the dressing room. And he became a very unpopular character. And then once he'd lost the fans in the stands, it was curtains, you know. But with Mikel Arteta, so far... You know, the fans have, have warmed to him. You know, we've started to see little bits and pieces, improvements on the pitch. And we realised that, you know, he's been left with a lot of shit. Let's be honest with it, Robbie. You know what I mean? He's been left with crap. And he's got to try and work with that. And one of the first things that we've noticed is that defensively, we are looking a little bit better. There is a structure to our defence now. We're not conceding 25 shots a game. Like we are, were under Unai Emery, you know, so we're starting to see things. Now, the detriment, the, the detriment of the defensive side working is that our attack has not been as potent, shall we say, mm. because we've been solely focusing on stopping conceding goals. 
the, you know, it's a balance. And he needs time to get that balance right. But it's going to take a good couple of years or so, Robbie, yet, man. A good couple of years. We need to... Yeah. We need we need to be smart in the market. Listen, before coronavirus was even here, we needed to be smart in the market. You know, remember, it's not all about big name signings. You know, we all get excited. Like when, when we signed a Bamiyang, I remember, along with thousands of other people, tracking his plane from Dortmund to, to England. <laughs> I remember Ivan Gazidis, you know, being pictured next to a, a chrome silver car. And everyone checking the minute details, going through his Instagram to see if he's posted that car. And, you know, you see his, his, um, his, his uh, slogan, his, his, his uh, logo on the side of the car and everything. And I remember that excitement. There's some players where you pay the money and you get that buzz, that excitement. You know, that like, wow, we bought someone like, yeah. But at the same time, there's players out there that you can look at and you can go, Hey, listen, do you remember when we signed Martinelli last year? He was the that first was player we signed. He was the first player we signed in the window. And I remember seeing so many people on social media. Who's this kid? Who's this unknown that plays on beaches in Brazil? Do you know what I mean? He's this, he's that. Now, one of our star players, been one of our best players this season. Breakthrough. Absolutely. If you actually, if you actually look at it, DT, yeah, our best part, take a Bamiang out of it. It's been all... All the sort of best players this season, being um, sort of the unknown, you know, Saka, yeah. Martinelli, yeah. Yeah. you know, um, Gwen Doozy's <laughs> at the start of the season. Of break. Huh? Listen, even, even Burn Leno, how much did he cost? Yeah, it's true. You know I mean? And, and I remember true, when, we so. Leno, when we signed Leno, people started putting, you know, videos online of maybe a mistake that he'd made in a game. Hmm. Oh, we got another Almunia. Oh, oh. All this and that. What would you rather do? Spend the 20 odd million we spent on Leno or spend 70, 80 million on spaghetti hands like Chelsea did? Nah, you're all right, mate. You're I think right. it's going to be, I think it's quite clear to see now. And, and this is where fans are going to have to be patient. When you look at that wage bill, when you look at the fact that a lot of that, Arteta is going to need a nut. We say, people say, he needs a couple of transfer window. I think right off this transfer window. This transfer window is not going to be him putting in place the team he wants. This mm -hmm. transfer window is going to be about him, like you said, like you just said, being smart, a couple of loan deals, a couple of maybe a swap deal here or whatever, right, and just consolidating and try to get a, still do what he's been doing so far, which he's done very well, which is getting yeah. the best out of what you've got. Then I feel if we can then get to the end of next season, get all those big earners, Urzils and all those people off the wage bill, then that's when he can go out there and say, right, I'm going to get this guy. And even then, I don't think you'll see him going for household names. They're going to be emerging players that could become the next best thing. He's mm -hmm. going to have to do a bit like what Wenger did when Wenger first came. A lot of Thierry Henry was a great prospect, but it not quite happened for him in the moves that he'd had before, so he got a good deal on him. Yeah. Vieira wasn't a household name. Perez was an emerging player. You know what I mean? I f you know, yeah. Lundberg wasn't a... So I think it's going to be back to that. It's going to have to be very intelligent, mm. smart signings and signings that suit the system that he wants, mixed up with a couple of top quality players. And that's why, for me, you keep a Bamiyang. You could keep that pain of those wages for a year, and then the, some of the high earners will be gone. Yeah, you're gonna yeah. go. No, I agree. And it, you you got to remember as well. Look at Mikel Arteta; he will have learned a lot at Man City. Um, and I know it's very easy to sit there and say, "Yeah, but Man City will just go out and buy a player." But Man City have also bought in players that were a bit unknown as well, and maybe a bit of a mm. risk and a gamble, and they've done what they've had to do. Um, Jesus was an unknown when he came through, mm. a bit like a Martinelli in that respect. So, you know, yeah, big talent, yeah, but big talent from Brazil, but has mm. to nurture them and do what they do. Um, I don't think Leroy Sane was as big a name as he is now when they brought him in. I know yeah. he's, he's still, he was still known. He was still, I think he was, still, yeah, he was still, up and coming though. He was emerging. Yeah, but that's what I mean. He's still a yeah. gamble. 
to yeah. go. That wasn't a ready-made player. That yeah, wasn't, yeah, you know what yeah. I mean, in, in that respect. So, you know, um, and even, you know, people might laugh at this year, but I, I think that, you know, when they brought in like a Fabian Delph, how important mm. he was to their team in certain matches at certain points in the season. He was very important and not just on the pitch, but in the dressing room, someone yeah. like that. Let's look at, what, what's his name that plays um, defensive midfield and has been filling in at centre-back? Oh, what's his um, name? Fernandinho. Fernandinho. Yeah. You know, someone like him. No one had heard of him before he came along to Man City. No, man. No, he was known. He was known. He was doing yeah, well. But, but what I'm saying is, yeah, but what I'm saying is, you, you, there's yeah, players. But, but, yeah. Those players weren't cheap. They were expensive players. Oh, yeah. They, they, weren't, were they weren't your top-end top guys, but they were expensive players. But definitely, if you look at the Liverpool model and stuff like that, you know, you got to get smart with it, and it's got to be yeah. a mixture of smart signings, guys that come from your academy, and do you know? You look at Trent Alexander Arnold that come from their academy. Really? Trent Alexander on. Oh, you said it right. Yeah. That you look you at somebody that. like uh, Robertson, you know, who come from Hull. Yeah. You know, imagine if we just signed Robertson, people would be like, oh, what, what boy plays from Hull. You yeah. know, yeah. You yeah. know? Yeah. Oh, you're right. You know, but yeah. it's going to be players that fit the system. And but yeah. I think it's going to be so important, and where I've been pleased with Arteta, and he's going to have to continue doing this is getting the best out of it because he, he's stuck with a lot of that. That's yeah. it. Oh yeah, he is. You are that stuck is. with him until the end of next year. One, one of the things that... you've got to get the best out of Urzel. You're stuck with him. Yeah. Good luck. Um, the the issue is is that you know I, I've said this to you on so many podcasts that Liverpool are that model in the sense that. They've spent money, but they've also spent money wisely. Mm. Yeah, they went out and bought a Van Dyke for 70 plus million and an Allison for whatever he cost mm. and that. But they didn't spend that out of their own money, they spent it out of the Coutinho money. Yeah. So they were smart with it. There's and other clubs as well. You, you know, Robertson. Um, you've got to remember as well, and a lot of people for, forget this, but when Trent Alexander Arnold came into the squad, they had Nathaniel Klein. Yeah. Who at that time was a really, really good right back. Yeah, one of the best the best done, and then he got an injury, I think it was. Trent yeah, Alexander Arnold had to come in and he's never looked back. Joe Gomez, he's mm. another one, centre back. But then you, you know? can look at other clubs, DT, right? Look at Wolves. Yeah. What are these players that who knew all these Jotters and Jimenez and people? Yeah, I mean, these were household names, weren't they? And they become top players. Look what they did with Adama Traore, bought him in have turned him into a top-level player. You know what I mean? So, mm. Leicester, same thing. You know, um, they buy somebody like a Madison from Norwich, not huge amounts of money, turn them into now, people are talking about, you know, to buy him, he'd be like £80 million pounds and these yeah. sort of things. You know what I mean? So, but the one thing that you look at Leicester, and this is what I think is a lesson to learn for Arsenal, the one thing is they retained Vardy. He may be the old boy in the team, but you know he guarantees you goals. Yeah. You know he knows what Leicester's all about. And he's the guy that is putting the goals away. And then they've got all these brilliant little young players and emerging talents all around him. And they're all mm -hmm. flourishing. And that's what Arsenal, that's what I don't want to see Arsenal do. Let go our best player, goal scorer, just because of age. Yeah. And then, yeah, because you can't have a team full of pure emerging talents or pure kids. You've got mm -hmm. to have a little bit of a mixture. So it's going to be really important the the you know what happens in the summer because they're going to have to be intelligent. And then next year, that's going to be the big one. Next year, summer, that's mm -hmm. going to be the big one for Arsenal to see what they do. Yeah. But we've come towards the end of the show today. Um enjoyed yeah. it. Um, it's been good, lots of things to talk about. Well, We're gonna be back uh, at the end of the week with another auger. We're doing two at the moment, um, per week. And I'm hoping that we get full. I mean, you, you don't seem to want it back. But no, 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 no. It's not that I don't want it back. It's just that I feel that there's bigger things going on in the world. You know, we're still losing yeah, seven, eight hundred. We're, we're still losing seven, eight hundred people a day. Yeah. You know, losing, you know, we're not losing our car keys. You know, people are losing their lives. These are people's lives. And just because we're not directly affected, just because someone in our family hasn't contracted coronavirus and passed away. You know, there's people out there that are genuinely suffering. Mm. 
and you know how can you sit pep guardiola a month ago lost his mum mm. and you want him to go and manage behind closed doors in an environment which is protecting you for something that killed his mum how must he feel standing on the touchline whatever wage man city pay pep guardiola ain't going to bring his mum back Ain't going to make him sit there on the touchline and feel any better. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll get paid this much a week. So it don't really matter about my mum, does it? Of course it doesn't. So that's what I'm trying to say. That it just doesn't, for me, it just doesn't feel right. That we're out there playing football and there's people dying. We're not talking 10, 15, 20 people and it's gone right down or... We're talking hundreds and hundreds, more than 21,000 people in the UK, Robbie. 21,000. Mm. You know, it's it's ridiculous, man. And I just, I don't agree with this whole St. George's Park, Man City training ground, Wembley. I actually think that they could do more harm to the Premier League than good by getting these games on. I actually do, because... You know, look, man, I, I know Liverpool want to win the league, but can you imagine Jordan Henderson standing there at St. George's Park and they've just won the league and he's got to lift up the Premier League trophy to a load of trees? <laughs> it's, it's like, come on, man. It's like, I look, I at the end of the day, we all banter Liverpool and stuff, but it would still be good to see, like, you know, rows and rows of fans on the street celebrating and trophy parades and we've been there we know what that feels like it's amazing it's the most amazing feeling seeing your your heroes your team come home and lift trophies and everything else but no fans no fans in there at all playing that will it lose the intensity that's the other thing you know the premier, league, the premier league is renowned for its intensity its pace its power and everything else what will it feel like you know, would it feel like a training game? It's just kind of like, I think it would do more harm than good. I genuinely yeah. do. Why not follow suit with, you know, France, Holland, and set a time in end of August, September, and say, that's when we go again. That's when the new season starts. Let's spend the next three, four months to get this country back on its feet, to get the death rate down, find a, uh, 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 what do you call it? A, um, sure. A cure for a vaccine. Um, and then let's make it one hell of a big party when we come back. We'll enjoy it more. We'll enjoy it a lot more. Mm. All right. Well, thanks, DT, man, um, for the speech at the end there. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, you know what? You you know what? Uh, you make some you make some brilliant points. And um, I don't think it's very hard to argue with what you said. It's very hard to argue with that. Obviously, the lot you're right. Lives come before football, um, one hundred percent. So, some great points made, and thanks everybody for uh, watching the show today. Um, all guns brazing podcast available on all formats, and we'll be back at the end of the week. The coronavirus has not just affected the world of football, but has affected everybody. But you know what? We can defeat it. If you're displaying any of the symptoms, always make sure that you self isolate. I know it's a terrible time but we will defeat the coronavirus. We will be back.